In the early days of April 1815, the island of Sumbawa in Indonesia seemed calm and alive with daily routines. Farmers worked the rice paddies, fishermen pushed their small wooden boats into the sea, and children played on the warm sand near the coast. Rising above them was a giant, Mount Tambora. At more than 4,000 meters tall, it was among the highest peaks in the archipelago. Its slopes were fertile, feeding the communities that lived around it. For centuries, the volcano had remained quiet. To the people of Sumbawa, Tambora was not a threat, but a blessing. Yet beneath the surface, pressure was building. Deep inside Tambora's magma chamber, molten rock and gas collected, trapped by the weight of the mountain itself. The earth groaned quietly, preparing for a violent release that no one could predict. The first warnings appeared in 1812. Small eruptions, clouds of smoke, and faint rumblings unsettled the nearby villages. But life went on. People believed these were minor disturbances, nothing unusual for those living in the Ring of Fire. In 1814, more ash appeared, drifting into the sky and settling on fields, but still the danger was underestimated. By early April 1815, the signs grew impossible to ignore. Columns of thick black smoke rose from the crater, staining the skies above Sumbawa. At night, villagers saw fire glowing from the mountain's peak, a terrifying lantern in the darkness. The air filled with sulfur. Animals grew restless. Some families whispered that the gods were angry. Still, many stayed in their homes, unsure of what else they could do. Then came April 5th, 1815. A massive explosion shook the island, so loud that sailors hundreds of kilometers away thought it was cannon fire. Ash rained down for hours, but this was only a warning. The true catastrophe had yet to come. On the evening of April 10th, 1815, just after sunset, the earth split open. Tambora unleashed a roar so loud it was heard more than 2,600 kilometers away, all the way to Sumatra. A pillar of fire shot into the sky, followed by torrents of ash and glowing rock. Within minutes, villages at the base of the volcano were engulfed in flame. Eyewitnesses described the night as if the sun had fallen to earth. The sky turned red, then black. Rivers of lava poured down the slopes, igniting forests and sweeping away everything in their path. People ran in terror, clutching children, but there was no safety. The air itself grew heavy with ash, choking lungs and blinding eyes. For three days, Tambora erupted without pause. A column of volcanic ash rose nearly 40 kilometers into the atmosphere, higher than any storm cloud. The sound of the explosion circled the globe. Ash darkened the skies hundreds of kilometers away. In Java, nearly 800 kilometers from Sumbawa, the darkness was so complete that people could not see their own hands before their faces. Entire villages vanished. On Sumbawa, the kingdoms of Tambora and Pakat were completely destroyed, their people erased from history. Ash buried fields and rice paddies, ensuring famine for survivors. The first waves of death came swiftly, burned by fire, crushed by collapsing houses, or suffocated under layers of volcanic ash. But Tambora's wrath was not finished. The sea itself began to respond. The explosion triggered tsunamis up to four meters high, which crashed onto nearby coasts. Fishing villages along Sumbawa and Lombok were swallowed whole. Ships anchored offshore were overturned like toys, their crews lost to the sea. By the end of April 1815, Tambora had blown away nearly half of its height, collapsing into itself. What had once been a towering mountain, over 4,000 meters tall, was reduced by 1,500 meters. In its place lay a caldera seven kilometers wide. Tens of thousands were already dead, but the greater disaster was only beginning. When Mount Tambora erupted in April 1815, it was not only Sumbawa that was shattered. The explosion was so immense that its true legacy stretched far beyond the Indonesian archipelago. The eruption blasted more than 150 cubic kilometers of ash, rock, and gas into the air. So much material that it altered the balance of the atmosphere itself. The volcanic plume reached the stratosphere, higher than any storm could rise, where it spread across the globe in invisible waves. Tiny particles of sulfur dioxide mixed with water vapor, forming aerosols that reflected sunlight back into space. For months, the skies around the world carried Tambora's signature. Glowing sunsets, darkened days, and an eerie chill that crept into every continent. At first, many found the sunsets beautiful. In London, artists painted skies of crimson and violet that seemed almost unreal. In Asia, travelers marveled at twilight colors that lingered for hours. Yet these displays were only the surface of a looming catastrophe. 
The sun was being dimmed, and with it, the warmth on which all life depended. By 1816, the full effect struck. That year is remembered as the year without a summer. In North America, June brought snow to New England. Frost fell in July and August, killing crops overnight. Farmers who had sown fields of corn and oats watched them blacken and die. Families slaughtered their livestock because there was no fodder left. Across Canada and the United States, thousands abandoned their homes, migrating westward in the hope of finding food. Europe faced chaos of its own. Torrential rains drenched the continent, temperatures remained unnaturally cold, and grain harvests failed repeatedly. In Switzerland, the summer was so bleak that lakes overflowed with relentless rain. Food grew scarce. Hunger riots broke out in France, Germany, and England, where desperate crowds demanded bread. Parents watched helplessly as children wasted away. The price of oats, the essential feed for horses, skyrocketed. Crippling transportation at a time when horses powered trade, farming, and armies. Asia did not escape Tambora's shadow. In India, the disruption of the monsoon cycle caused both drought and famine. Crops failed, rivers ran dry, and hunger spread rapidly. In southern China, flooding ruined rice fields along the Yangtze, creating starvation that killed countless families. Disease followed hunger. Outbreaks of cholera swept through India and beyond, spreading death across Asia. Historians believe the indirect death toll reached into the millions. What began as a firestorm in Indonesia became a worldwide crisis of hunger, disease, and despair. And yet, Tambora's influence was not only measured in death, it also shaped culture. In the gloomy summer of 1816, a group of young writers gathered at Lake Geneva in Switzerland. Trapped indoors by the endless rain, they challenged one another to invent ghost stories. Among them was Mary Shelley, who began to write about a scientist who creates life in defiance of nature. That story became Frankenstein, a masterpiece born from Tambora's shadow. Lord Byron, also there, penned his haunting poem, Darkness, describing a sunless world where men forgot their passions in the dread of this desolation. The bleak imagination of that year would ripple through literature for centuries. For science, Tambora became a turning point. It revealed to humanity that the Earth S systems were interconnected, that a volcano on a small island could influence weather across the planet. Later, volcanologists would rank it as a VEI-7 eruption, the largest in more than a thousand years. Its power dwarfed even Krakatoa in 1883. Today, the giant sleeps again. Its slopes are covered in green, its caldera a vast scar filled with silence. Tourists climb Tambora's trails, unaware that they stand on the site of one of history's greatest disasters. For the people of Sumbawa, the memory remains in oral stories passed from generation to generation, a reminder of fire, ash, and loss. Mount Tambora's eruption was more than a natural disaster. It was a reminder of human fragility, a lesson that civilizations can be humbled in a single moment by the hidden forces of the Earth. In 1815, the volcano roared, and for years afterward, the entire world trembled in its wake.